Gut, in diesem Sinne würde ich dann äh, sagen, dieser hochinteressante Kollege mit seiner wirklich anschaulichen Erzählung über die Verhältnisse in Südafrika ist eigentlich weltberühmt nicht dafür, sondern für seine Forschungen zur Neuropsychoanalyse. Und wir haben ihn gebeten, in unserer, als Auftakt unserer Reihe zur internationalen Psychoanalyse an der Akademie München, uns ein bisschen was eben auch von dieser Forschung zu erzählen, und zwar mit Bezug auf die Praxis. Max Solms könnte tief ausholend über sehr ähm, grundlegende Fragen der Neurowissenschaften sprechen. Er wird es auch demnächst hier von unserer IPU aus äh, in Berlin mit, äh, mit äh, Thomas Fuchs, einem deutschen Philosophen, ein Grundsatzgespräch führen über das Problem des Bewusstseins in der Philosophie und in der Neuropsychoanalyse. Also da geht es in die Theorie. Aber für uns heute Abend, Marc, hast du eher auch ähm, die Themen vorbereitet, die für praktizierende Psychoanalytikerinnen und Psychoanalytiker von großer Bedeutung sind. Wer diesen Artikel liest, wird auch sehen, er ist am Anfang etwas theoretisch äh, für die Basics, für die Basic Claims, aber dann wird er wirklich sehr, sehr praktisch, denn wenn wir ein klares Konzept des Unbewussten haben, dann wissen wir auch sehr genau, warum wir eigentlich so arbeiten, wie wir arbeiten. Und ich glaube, das ist genug. Enough of an introduction for the moment. Und jetzt genießen Sie das wirklich sehr gut verständliche Englisch von Max Sanz. Yes, uh, it is very, so again, forgive me, I'm going to be speaking in English and now you're not going to have a, a, um, a translation. Um, you have that paper that was mentioned. Um, that you'll, you'll be able to read uh, uh, sort of generally the things that I'm going to talk about in English, you'll be able to read it in that paper. Um, the, the fact that I'm South African uh, is just uh, an accident of birth. Um, and my uh, involvement with South Africa has to do with my own personal life uh, and, and why I had to go back there. We've spoken about that. Um, but really, the main focus of my own scientific career has been something quite different, as Andreas Hamburg had just said. Um, my, my scientific career has been directed toward the question of the relationship between psychoanalysis and the neurological sciences. Um, and it started out as a purely theoretical exercise. Uh, how, how can we relate these two fields to each other? We're studying Uh, memory, we're studying perception, we're studying feelings, we're studying, you know, uh, selfhood uh, it, from both of these different points of view. And um, so I've been very interested in how uh, they can be related, to, can be communicated to each other, how we can learn from each other. Um, and in recent years, that exercise, which was a purely scientific and theoretical exercise, has delivered some um, insights which I think are of direct practical relevance to the practice, uh, the clinical practice of psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic psychotherapy. So what I want to do in this talk is just give you an overview. It's a, obviously a very big and very complicated topic. So I can only give you an introduction. I just want to give you some sense of some of the themes uh, that have come out of this uh, interdisciplinary scientific endeavor uh, that are of uh, practical relevance to clinical psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic psychotherapy. So I'm now going to share my screen if I can, and I'm going to show you some slides. Uh, here it is. Um, and there's my title, uh, Clinical Implications of Neuropsychoanalysis. Um, and this is the paper that uh, uh, Angela has so kindly translated. Uh, 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 I, um, because what I'm going to say, not only is it in English and therefore difficult for some of you to, uh, to take in, but also it's, it's in a different language from psychoanalytic language. I'm talking about neuroscientific concepts, 
So this is, uh, it's, it's difficult to take it all in. Uh, and then also I'm trying to cover a vast and complicated field. Uh, so I very much do recommend that you read the paper. It will be much easier uh, for you to assimilate what it is that I'm trying to say to you. I'm just going to give headlines now, that's all. I'm going to divide my presentation into two parts. Um, first, I'm going to talk about uh, das S, uh, and then I'm going to talk about uh, das Ish, uh, very broadly speaking. So we start with das S, with what we in English call the id. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to summarize these very brief points. Um, we start from the uh, observation that we human beings are a species of animal. Uh, we, are, we are biological creatures. Uh, and so we have innate needs uh, like all other creatures. And these are what Freud called drives. Uh, they constitute his id. Now, uh, I want to tell you what we have learned uh, in neuroscience in recent years about the drives, um, but many psychoanalysts get nervous when a neuroscientist starts saying, these are things we've learned in neuroscience uh, and we think they're relevant to psychoanalysis. So um, in this case, I want to point out to you, I want to remind you that when it comes to the life of the drives, uh, Freud always, uh, expected. In fact, he thought it was essential uh, that we must look to biology uh, for, uh, an, for a classification of the drives. He says that he's doubtful whether decisive pointers on the classification of the drives can be arrived at by working over the psychological material. He says this working over seems to call for the application to the material of definite assumptions concerning the drives and it would be a desirable thing if those assumptions could be taken from some other branch of knowledge and carried over to psychology. And that other branch of knowledge is biology. Freud said that there is a necessity for borrowing from the science of biology when it comes to drive theory. Uh, and he said, biology is truly a land of unlimited possibilities. And he said, we may expect it to give us the most surprising information. And we can't guess what answers it will return in a few dozen years. That was in 1920. A few dozen years have happened. Freud said that these answers to the questions that psychoanalysis is putting to biology may be of a kind that will blow away the whole artificial structure of our hypotheses. So uh, please uh, 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 understand that when I come uh, as a neuroscientist and say, psychoanalysis has something to learn about drives from biology, uh, that's not me speaking, it's Freud speaking. Freud said that uh, all along, especially when it comes to drive theory. So Freud defined drive um, as a measure of the demand made upon the mind to perform work in consequence of its connection with the body. That is his famous definition of what a drive is. And I want to tell you what, what we have learned uh, in neurobiology about what this means. What is a measure of the demand made upon the mind to perform work in consequence of its connection with the body? Uh, in the, at the very end of Freud's life, there was a fundamental discovery in biology of a mechanism called homeostasis. And uh, this sheds beautiful, clear light on what a drive is. In homeostasis, uh, and this is a fundamental mechanism in biology, uh, we living creatures, we have to stay within certain narrow bounds. Uh, there's a certain temperature that we have to stay within. It's between 36 and a half degrees Celsius and 37 and a half degrees Celsius. That's where we need to be. The same applies to our blood gases, our oxygen and carbon dioxide ratio. The same applies to our water in relation to our salt content of our bodies. Uh, the same applies to glucose supplies, everything. Uh, there's, there, there's, a, there's a very specific range that's viable, that's compatible with life. And if we move outside of that range, we die. If you get too hot, you die. If you have too little water, you die. If you have too little sugar, you die. Um, that's 
Homeostasis is the mechanism whereby we stay within our viable bounds. Uh, so deviations from those viable bounds are demands for work. The body has to do something in order to get us back to where we need to be. That's a measure, how far we've moved from where we need to be is a measure of the demand for work. And when it comes to a measure of the demand on the mind for work, uh, these, these demands are felt. And this is, this is what an unpleasant feeling is. It's a, it's a drive demand. It's a, it, it's a measure of the demand uh, of where, of something that we need to do something to get back to uh, what is viable for us. And so the feeling tells us how well or badly we are doing. Uh, when, we, when we make a prediction, if I do that, it will help. Uh, if I do that, it will get me back to where I need to be. Um, if that prediction is working or not, uh, we know from how it feels. It feels pleasurable if we're heading in the right direction. It feels unpleasurable if we're heading in the wrong direction. So the very simple mechanism of homeostasis, which lies at the heart of biology, uh, it explains that what a drive is, uh, and, and, and it places Freudian drive theory uh, uh, on very solid foundations. Um, there are many things I could tell you about homeostasis, which, uh, which have led us uh, to have to rethink some aspects of Freudian drive theory. Uh, and the most interesting one um, is that when you have no need, uh, what Freud called nirvana, which he said was beyond the pleasure principle, jenseits des Lustprinzips, uh, that we're seeking this state of tranquility, of no need, of, of, of nirvana, um, that is the homeostatic settling point. Uh, and the deviations from it are what give rise to feelings of pleasure and unpleasure. So these are not two separate principles. That's the important thing to say about homeostasis, uh, that the pleasure principle serves the nirvana principle. And the second thing is that the nirvana principle um, is not deathly, that to be in a state of no need, in a state of tranquility, in a state of no demand for work um, is the ideal state of living systems. Now, there's a lot of complexity uh, in what I've just said to you. There's a lot of controversy in what I've just said to you. I'm just indicating to you that the principle of homeostasis sheds new light on uh, what we mean by nirvana. But I'm, I'm not going to say any more about that for now. Um, what I'm going to say instead um, is that what I've just said about bodily states, that we have viable bounds that we have to remain in and deviations from that are felt, um, the same applies to our emotional needs. There are viable states uh, and deviations from that are felt as emotional feelings. So just as hunger tells you that your nutritional needs are not being met, thirst tells you that your hydration needs are not being met, sleepiness tells you that your need to rest is not being met, um, and so on. The same applies to emotions. And I'm going to concentrate on the emotional drives uh, because those are the ones that are of importance to us psychotherapists and psychoanalysts. So what I'm going to do now is give you a very quick tour of what we have learned in neurobiology about what the basic emotional drives are. Remember what I showed you in my first slides. I said Freud expected that neurobiology would give new insights into the classification of the drives. So what I'm going to tell you now is what we have learned in neurobiology about the classification of the emotional drives, which are the which are the fundamental forces that motivate us human beings to do what we do. Uh, so it's very, these are very important, uh, this is very important knowledge to know what the basic drives are. Um, and these drives, uh, remember I'm speaking uh, as a neuroscientist, so I'm telling you about what we've learned about the anatomy and physiology and chemistry of these drives. These are not hypothetical constructs. These are things which actually exist in the brain, which we can stimulate electrically and stimulate chemically. We can study what happens when these circuits are damaged. So this is very solid knowledge about what the basic drives are. 
uh, in the human being. The first uh, is, is called lust, uh, which is, of course, the sexual drive. You all know what the sexual drive is. Um, when Freud said um, 120 years ago uh, that we human beings are like animals and we have a sexual drive, uh, it was quite shocking uh, to his contemporaries to speak about us in those terms. But of course, he was right. And now, uh, 100 years later, we can identify exactly where these circuits are that underlie the sexual drive. Human beings have a sexual drive um, and, it, and we have a sexual chemistry uh, and the chemicals, we know what they are, estrogen and, and, and testosterone and, and oxytocin and vasopressin, you know, and we can manipulate these things. Uh, and uh, we, we've learned a great deal about this drive. There's a lot I could tell you, I could speak to you for four hours just about the sexual drive. Uh, I will say nothing more to you other than there it is, it exists. Um, and, and then I'll tell you the next thing, which is that Freud's conception of the sexual drive was much broader uh, than other biologists. Uh, biologists normally think about sexuality in, 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 you know, in a narrower way than we psychoanalysts do. Uh, and Freud's broader concept of a libidinal drive, uh, of an erotic drive, which wasn't only about, about a, a genital sexuality. Um, the, 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 the discovery of this uh, drive, which we call seeking, um, overlaps with Freud's broader concept of a, of a libidinal drive. So what Freud, uh, the sexual drive, and the broader libidinal drive, um, we actually think in neuroscience today that they're two separate things, uh, that the seeking system, the seeking drive, uh, it's driven by a different chemical, it's called dopamine, um, and it makes us go out into the world uh, with the positive expectation that our needs will be met there. It makes us explore the world. Um, and, uh, uh, a heightened activation of this system feels manic. It feels optimistic, enthusiastic, energetic, excited, curious, interested in the world uh, with the expectation that everything I want, I'm going to get out there. Um, and uh, uh, by, by the way, Freud uh, learned about the libidinal drive at the time that he was snorting cocaine. Uh, cocaine activates this system beautifully. Uh, it, 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 if you want to know what the seeking drive feels like and what, it, what, it, what kinds of behaviors and mental states it gives rise to, then just look at somebody who's high on cocaine. So these are manic states of mind <laughs> and, the, and the blocking of this, the, the opposite, the negative. Um, remember what I've said, each of these has a positive and a negative. Uh, the negative of seeking is depression. And remember also what I've said to you, that these are not hypotheses, uh, these are experimentally demonstrable things. You can induce a severe depression by blocking dopamine uh, in this system, uh, by, by, uh, uh, as has been done. Um, and, and conversely, you can, you, can un you can move somebody from a depressive state into a manic state by stimulating the system um, uh, electrically or chemically. So, um, each of these things comes with the innate prediction. I said that they're predictions. We're born with predictions. There are certain kinds of sexual uh, actions which are innate, which are built into us. Uh, th uh, things like mounting behavior, lordosis, thrusting, intromission, and so on. These are built-in predictions. With this one, the built-in prediction, it's called foraging behavior. Uh, we, 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 we just explore. Uh, and while we're exploring uh, what we're looking for, uh, we, 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 we discover. So lust stimulates seeking, but they're not the same thing. So the stimulation of seeking can come from sexual desire, but it can also come from any other desire because whatever it is that we need, it's out there in the world. And that's what this system does. Um, the third drive is a rage drive. Um, it's, it's an aggressive drive. And, and, and remember what I said about homeostasis, that here the viable bounds are 
uh, I, I, nothing must be impeding me, nothing must be standing between me and what I need, nothing must be getting in my way. And if something is getting in your way, then you have unpleasure, a particular kind of unpleasure, uh, which is called rage. Um, and then you have a prediction, uh, the instinctual prediction that we're born with, uh, which is that you must attack to get rid of that thing. And if you do, then you have the pleasure of, the, of defeating uh, your, your, the, the, this, this frustrating obstacle, this thing that is in your way. Again, we know the anatomy of this circuit. We know the chemistry of this circuit. Um, and um, there's a great deal more I could say about it. Let me say though, at this point, that these instinctual predictions that we're born with, that when I feel frustration, when there's something standing between me and what I want, I attack it. Uh, that's, that instinctual prediction is too crude. It's too simple. Uh, it's too basic. Uh, so we need to learn from experience. What else can we do? Uh, what can we attack? What can't we attack? What else can we do other than just attack? So we learn from experience better ways of meeting our emotional needs than the instinctual predictions that we are born with. Uh, the fourth uh, system is called fear. Um, again, there's a homeostatic settling point, which means I am not in danger. There's nothing threatening life and limb. Uh, and then when you are in danger, you, that's a demand upon the mind to perform work. Uh, there's a need, a need to get away from the danger, and it feels like fear. Um, and then you have a prediction. We are born with an instinctual prediction, which is we freeze or we flee. That's the built-in instinctual behavior. But you can't freeze and run away every time you're scared. So you have to learn from experience what else to do uh, and what to be fearful of, what not to be fearful of, um, and, and what other than freezing and running away, how else can you deal with danger? And so you learn in this much more complex way how to meet this emotional need for safety. Then there's another kind of anxiety in the brain. There's fear is one kind of anxiety. Another kind of anxiety is panic, which is separation anxiety. It's anxiety about loss, uh, loss of a caregiver uh, in particular. We human beings are mammals and mammals can't look after themselves when they're little. Uh, they're, that's the very meaning of mammals is that they have to be suckled um, and so we have to find, we have to have somebody who looks after us and we have to attach to that somebody. Um, and this need is to keep that attachment figure nearby, to keep her caring for you, to keep her interested in you, to keep her feeding you, um, to keep her protecting you. And if she's not nearby, then you have panic, you have separation distress. Uh, and there's an instinctual behavior, which is a prediction about what you should do about that. And it is that you must cry out, mama. We call them distress vocalizations and search for her. That's what we do. Um, and this, this circuit is mediated by opioids, uh, which is the, uh, the endorphins, the natural chemicals, uh, which are the equivalent of drugs, artificial drugs, like like um, heroin and morphine, um, opiate drugs um, uh, that are very, very addictive substances. And, and that's because this is an addiction mechanism. We become addicted to our caregiver. And then if you separate it from her, you have withdrawal symptoms. Um, and those withdrawal symptoms are opioid withdrawal symptoms. This is an opiate system. Um, and if the if the separation distress, panicky behavior does not result in reunion, then it leads to grief. Uh, and grief is a shutting down of seeking. The, 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 the little one stops trying, uh, no longer cries out, no longer searches, but gives up hope. Uh, and that's a shutting down of seeking. Um, and that's why this drive has got two different names, panic and grief, depending on the short-term response and the longer term response. There's a lot, a lot, a lot that could be said about um, the, all of these systems. I'm just giving you a basic introduction. Uh, by the way, uh, panic disorder uh, and major depression, they have a high comorbidity. Uh, 
and but in the in the ICD and DSM classifications, these are in two separate categories. Uh, there are anxiety disorders and their mood disorders, uh, but they they belong in the same category when it comes to panic anxiety. Fear anxiety is a very different thing from panic. Uh, panic belongs together with depression. Um, they're two two sides of the same drive, two states of the same emotional need. Uh, the one is I'm losing, uh, I, I, and the other one is I have lost uh, an attachment object. Uh, I'm sorry I have to go so quickly. Uh, we have so little time. There's another attachment drive which we call <laughs> care. It's a nurturing drive. We need to look after little dependent vulnerable ones. Um, and if we, uh, uh, and so the, 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 the homeostatic deviation there is, you know, my baby is crying. Uh, this, this, uh, I need to make it better. It's an unpleasant state. Uh, and it's a pleasant state to be able to put it right. And we have instinctual behaviors like picking up the baby and rocking it and, and, and mother ease, this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, emotional tone with, 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 which, with which we speak to the baby. All of these things are built into us. But as every parent knows, um, that's not enough. You have to learn what else to do. Uh, uh, what does this particular cry now mean? And so on. And again, these things are related to pathologies. Uh, like I've said, um, this is related to panic disorder and major depression. And this is related to PTSD. And you know, this is related to anger management issues. And this is related to mania and so on. Um, so to this is related to psychopathologies like, for example, postpartum depression. Uh, the, 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 the feeling of being overwhelmed uh, by having this little one who depends on you, who needs you, uh, that you have to care for. Um, and then the last of the drives, this because there are seven emotional drives in the human brain, the last one is always a big surprise to people. It is play, that human beings need to play. Um, and not only human beings, all mammals, they need to play. Uh, and it's uh, why it's such a surprise is it's easy to see why sexuality uh, and fear and rage uh, and, and attachment and so on, why these are so important for survival. But it's not clear at all why play is important, but we need to play. If you deprive a, a young mammal uh, of half an hour's play today, it will play half an hour more tomorrow. It tries to make up for the lost time because we have a need to play. And uh, we've studied this a great deal in neurobiology. What is this, what is this need for? What is it all about? Uh, and it seems to have to do with the social nature of our species, uh, that we live in groups. Uh, and it's important for the viability of a social species um, that uh, we must behave in ways that are in the best interests of the group as a whole. And uh, it, mammal species, primate species, and the human species included, um, we form groups, and these groups have a hierarchical structure. They all have a hierarchical structure. And play seems to be an important part of how the hierarchy is established, how each, how each child finds their place within the hierarchy. Uh, so it's got to do with a dominance drive. Uh, and it's in, 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 and not everyone can dominate. So with, there's a rule that governs play. It's called the 60-40 rule, um, which is there's always one who dominates and one who's submissive, uh, uh, but the ratio is 60 to 40. If this one wants to dominate too much, then there's no fun in it for this one. And then he won't play anymore. He says, you're not being fair and he won't play. So it's learning about what kind, what kind of power relationships um, are viable. In other words, uh, how much can you get away with? Um, uh, uh, and if you want to continue the fun, maintain the pleasure of play, uh, then you have to make sure that it's fun for your playmate too. You have to take turns. You have to take turns. There has to be reciprocity. There has to be mutuality. So uh, these are some of the things that we've learned through the study of uh, the neurobiology of play. 
And again, I could easily talk to you for a whole day about what we've learned about play. Um, but the main reason I'm introducing you to these drives is to say to you again, these are the basic natural kinds of emotional need in the human being. Each of us must learn how to meet these needs. And if we don't learn how to meet these needs, we suffer from these feelings um, that I've been talking about, fear, anxiety, separation, distress, depression, rage, etc. Uh, we suffer from the feelings um, that announce the needs that we have not learned how to meet. So it's very valuable knowledge about what the basic drives are uh, that, that um, motivate uh, uh, human feeling uh, and human behavior. I, I wish I could say more about play. I can only tell you that a patient who hasn't learned how to play is in a lot of trouble. Um, I won't have an opportunity to say more to you about these drives. Uh, I know tomorrow I'm, I'm doing a group supervision with a small, uh, a, a, a small number of, of people who are in this lecture. You will all learn more tomorrow uh, about these drives. I'm going to show you, um, tomorrow we're going to look at a case um, and I'll show you how, how a knowledge of these drives helps us to understand our patients. But now I have to move on to the second part of my talk, the part about das Ich. The great task of mental life is learning how to meet our needs. That's what I've just said to you. We have these needs. We have these seven emotional needs. The bodily needs are easy to learn how to meet. It's easy to learn how to eat and how to urinate and how to sleep and how to avoid painful stimuli and so on. Um, but learning how to keep your caregiver close to you or, or learning how to get people to have sex with you, especially the particular people who you want to have sex with. It's hard. Um, and, you know, and, and, and so on. So learning how to meet our emotional needs is the great task of mental life. Um, and that's what Freud calls ego development, as we call das Ich in English, the ego. Needs are felt. If we do not learn how to master our drives, we feel them. And that's what I was just saying to you a few minutes ago. Our patients suffer mainly from feelings. Um, that at the heart of psychopathology uh, are emotional, unpleasant emotions. Um, and within the neuropsychoanalytic frame of reference, what we've learned is to understand that to, to understand which feeling the patient is suffering from tells us which one of these basic emotional needs are not being met. Um, and that's why. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, this classification of the drives um, has turned out to be of such great value to us um, as clinicians. Uh, the, the feelings that our patients suffer from tell us which of their emotional needs uh, are not being met. Now, I told you that how we meet our needs uh, is through predictions. The predictions are, I told you, we're born with instinctual predictions. If I'm in danger, I must freeze or I must flee. Uh, if I'm frustrated, if something's in my way, I must attack. But I also told you, you can't, you can't just do those basic things. You need to learn a hell of a lot more than those basic predictions that we're born with. That's what learning is for. When I say, when I say that the great task of mental life is learning how to meet our needs, uh, it's learning. Uh, it, it, learning involves formulating predictions. Memories are about the past, but they're for the future. The whole purpose of learning from experience is that experience tells you what worked and what didn't work in the past. As a, and this is a basis for future behavior. What, what you do in the future uh, it depends upon what happened in the past. So although memories are about the past, they are for the future. And that's why in neuroscience today, we speak of memory as prediction. The whole, the, whole, the whole process of learning from experience is in order to be able to predict. And remember, learning is not just some cognitive faculty. Uh, it's learning how to meet our needs. That's why we need to learn in the first place. That's why we have an ego uh, that develops uh, 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 on top of the ego. So, this is what I'm talking about, this process of prediction. I said that this is the measure of the demand made upon the mind for work. This is the drive. 
uh, and, it's, and, and it gives rise to these different unpleasures that I just told you about the seven major types of them. Then we have predictions, the ones we're born with, which are not enough to learn how to meet those needs. And so the task of the ego, learning from experience, is learning new predictions. This very simple concept uh, is extremely powerful in terms of understanding what it is that we're dealing with in our patients in ways that I will now move on to explain. Uh, in, before I can uh, fully do that, um, I need to remind you that Freud divided um, our memory systems, which I'm calling prediction systems. Freud divided our memory systems into two great categories. Uh, he said that there's a pre-conscious, a forebewusst system and an unbewusst system. Uh, and the, the, what that means is that these ones can be brought back to consciousness. Uh, you can become conscious of your prediction, and then you can rethink it. Um, and these ones, you cannot become conscious of them. That's what unconscious means as opposed to pre-conscious. The unconscious predictions run their course automatically. They are automatized predictions. Unconscious predictions are automatized responses to our needs. Now, there are all kinds of biological reasons why we automatize our predictions. Uh, I don't have time, sadly, to go into it, but all I can tell you is that in, in cognitive neuroscience today, this distinction between memories that can be brought to consciousness and memories that can't is absolutely fundamental to our way of understanding memory. Uh, and we, there's a process that we call reconsolidation which I'm just uh, uh, telling you about now, a, a memory, which remember is a prediction, memories are predictions, a memory that can be brought back to consciousness can be reconsolidated. That means we can change that prediction. It's a flexible prediction. Uh, uh, that's why it comes back to consciousness. So we feel our way through the problem again. It's a state of uncertainty. And then we consolidate a new prediction. So whenever a prediction does not have the outcome that's expected, whenever a prediction does not lead to pleasure, but instead leads to continuation or even an increase of unpleasure, that prediction um, needs to be revised. We call that prediction error. And so the prediction, which is an unconscious thing, unless it leads to error, then it comes back to consciousness. So I just thought I would show you this quotation from Freud which says it in a very beautiful, very simple way, uh, that, that a memory trace is a stable, unconscious thing, which just runs its course. And when it, when it becomes conscious, it is no longer a memory trace. This is what Freud was saying. You dissolve the memory trace. Uh, this is literally what happens at a neurophysiological level. This is literally what happens in, neuro, in, in reconsolidation. The memory, the, the memory is actually dissolved. Uh, and then you have a state of consciousness, a state of uncertainty, and then you lay down a new prediction. Um, and so these two things are incompatible with each other. A state of consciousness is a state of uncertainty. A state of a, a memory is a prediction. In other words, this is what I believe will work. Uh, and it's only when it doesn't work that it has to return to the uncertain state. Um, we understand all of this very deeply at a neurophysiological level. Um, I, I, I don't have time to go into all of that, but I hope that you can see why I'm telling you this, uh, is that this process um, of memories coming back to consciousness, predictions coming back to consciousness so that we can rethink them, change our minds, um, this is at the heart of what we do uh, in psychotherapy. So I told you that there are um, that we, uh, the, the idea that there is a pre-conscious and an unconscious memory system, uh, that this is fundamental in cognitive neuroscience. Uh, the, nowadays, we all know that, not only psychoanalysts know that. Uh, we use different words for it. We say declarative long-term memory. Uh, we divide short-term memory and long-term memory. Uh, we say that long-term memory uh, the pre-conscious type, the ones that can come back into consciousness, which we call short-term memory, where they become reconsolidated, where they become, remember what Freud said, that the consciousness arises instead of a memory trace. 
So consciousness arises instead of a memory trace. That's when a long-term memory goes into consciousness and it becomes a state of uncertainty and then it's consolidated back into long-term memory. It's only these long-term memories that can be reconsolidated in that way. These ones, the non-declarative, unconscious ones, cannot be brought back into consciousness. So this map that I'm showing you on the screen here, it's, this, it's an updated version of this map. Freud was speaking about memory systems, about unconscious ones and pre-conscious ones. And this is how we see it today. We've learned a lot more about how the pre-conscious is structured and how the unconscious is structured and the different types of unconscious memory. Um, I don't have time to go into all of that, but I'm just saying that these that in taking this knowledge into uh, uh, a psychoanalysis, us learning about new things about how unconscious memories work and how pre-conscious memories work um, and, uh, 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 and so on. All of this is, is of great value to us. I'm going to uh, draw attention only to two things um, which are of particular relevance. Um, and one of them is what I've just said to you. Non-declarative memories cannot be brought back into consciousness. It's not that they don't want to be. It's that they cannot be. It's not possible. That's what non-declarative means uh, as opposed to declarative. So the idea that the fundamental mechanism of psychoanalytic treatment is that you bring unconscious memories back into a conscious state. We in cognitive neuroscience, we're saying, how can you do that? Uh, unconscious memories are unconscious. Uh, if you can bring them back into a state of consciousness, then they're pre-conscious. Uh, that's the declarative system. And we also know why these memories can't be brought back into consciousness. It's because this, the pre-conscious ones are cortical. Cortical memories are in the form of images. Images can be, can be thought, uh, but the unconscious memories, they're not cortical. They are in these subcortical structures where they're not in the form of images. They're just response patterns. A leads to B, A leads to B. They're stereotyped automatic response patterns that function by primary process. There's no thinking. It's just automatic. The one thing leads to the other thing fast uh, and, 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 and automatically. Um, secondary process where there's the slow business of bringing things to mind um, and remembering them and working them over uh, in, in short-term memory, in consciousness, um, is a cortical process. So this is the first of the things I needed to tell you that we have learned in neuroscience about memory, that unconscious memories cannot be brought back to consciousness because they're not in a form that's thinkable. The only way that you can, um, the way in which you remember unconscious memories is you enact them, you repeat them, you don't remember them. And I hope for some of you that will ring a bell because uh, this is what Freud taught us also, that remembering uh, and repeating are the pre-conscious system is, is rememberable. The unconscious system is repeated, stereotyped, repetition, compulsion, primary process, automatic, unthinkable, but not in the form of images. It's literally deeply, profoundly unconscious. So um, the fact that it cannot be brought back to consciousness and the, and the fact that it is not in the form of thoughts, of images, these are the two things I wanted to emphasize, which I think are of the most uh, direct relevance to uh, our, our practice. Uh, of, of psychoanalytic therapy, which, as I said, has everything to do with changing our patient's predictions. Uh, the, if I can put it into very simple terminology in terms of what I've been saying, how we go about meeting our emotional needs. So some predictions are illegitimately or prematurely automatized. These are the predictions that constitute what Freud called the repressed. So the unconscious memory systems that I showed you on the screen a little while ago, they don't all consist in repressed memories. Many of our automatized memories serve us very well, our automatized predictions. Um, it is only the ones that are illegitimately or prematurely automatized uh, that we call the repressed. In other words, they don't actually, these are predictions which don't actually meet the need, and yet they have been automatized. 
And uh, that's why I say they've been automatized illegitimately or prematurely. They're basically the mechanism whereby this happens uh, is that they are the best predictions that the child could come up with at the time. Uh, ch uh, children have the same emotional needs that adults do, but they don't have the same uh, cognitive capacity and they're not independent and they're not physically capable uh, of meeting their needs in the ways that adults do. So many of these problems, these problems, in other words, the emotional needs uh, that we have to learn how to meet, many of them uh, are insoluble to children. And so the insolubility, uh, problems which can't be solved are prematurely or illegitimately, the predictions which don't really work are automatized. And this is how we understand how that part of the non-declarative memory systems, uh, which is the modern name for the unconscious memory systems, that part of them that, that, that we call the repressed, that's how we understand how they are constituted. Again, remember, please, I'm just giving you a very basic schematic summary. I, I, I don't have time to go into any of the details, but I hope that you're getting a rough idea. So now I said that the aim of the talking cure, the aim of our psychoanalytic therapy, is to update illegitimately automatized predictions. So in other words, the, the ways in which our patients are going about meeting their needs, which is what we've learned over a lifetime of what works, how, do, when I'm in this emotional state, this is what I do. In other words, when I have this emotional need, this is what prediction uh, I, I execute. Um, and the ones that are unconscious and don't really work, don't serve us well, they're childish predictions, they're unrealistic predictions, They've been prematurely or illegitimately automatized because they were the best that the child could come up with at that time. Uh, these are the cause of the feelings that our patients suffer from on the simple homeostatic mechanism that I told you earlier. So the aim of the talking cure is to update those automatized, in other words, to bring them uh, to consciousness so that they can be so that they can be reconsolidated. But remember, I told you that the problem is that uh, you can't bring uh, these unconscious predictions back to consciousness. So how can we do that? How do we update illegitimately automatized predictions? Um, so the way that we do that is not by remembering the prediction because you can't, but rather by drawing attention to its manifestations in the transference. So remember I said to you that unconscious predictions, non-declarative predictions, they can be enacted, they can be repeated, but they can't be remembered. So the acting, the doing, uh, which we call transference, uh, that's what we can, that's the only way that we can remember uh, the unconscious predictions. We can't remember them in thoughts, uh, we remember them in action. And so what the task of the analytic therapist is, is to draw to the patient's attention uh, the pattern of behavior that they're using unconsciously, automatically, unknowingly, uh, the, way, the way in which they're going about meeting their emotional needs. Um, so I hope that that's clear. You can't, you can't undo the repressions. You can't bring the repressed memory back to consciousness, but you can draw the patient's attention to what they're doing. Can you see you're doing this over and over again? Can you see it's meant to meet that need? Uh, can you see it isn't meeting that need? Can you see that's why you're suffering from this feeling? That's the sort of basic structure of what we mean by transference interpretation. This, this is the only way that we can make the patient aware um, of, of, of what their unconscious predictions are. And by the way, we don't use the word transference to apply only to what the patient does with their therapist. It's, it's tr transferences are with all their current objects. Uh, so it's transference means transferring from infantile primary objects to current, uh, current day um, uh, um, uh, 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 adult life uh, objects. And the analyst is just one of those objects. So when I speak of patterns of how the patient goes about meeting those needs automatically, unconsciously, by enacting a prediction, I don't mean only with the patient. 
So I'm coming to the end of what I wanted to say to you. Here's a very brief and basic summary um, of, of, of how our technique, uh, how, what, what we think um, from, on the basis of the things I've told you, um, what we think uh, the, imp the implications are for how it can influence our technique. Uh, the first thing is that we, spay, we pay special attention to what feeling the patient is suffering from because the nature of the patient's suffering, the, 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 the type of feeling, depression versus fear anxiety versus panic anxiety, um, et cetera, tells us which one of these emotional needs is not being met. Uh, and that's very important because uh, it's the heart of the patient's suffering. Our patients suffer, as I said, from feelings. These are conscious things, and we can observe feelings for the most part. Uh, they're not something unconscious. But then it comes to the question of, well, what's causing this suffering? Uh, and the way that we in neuropsychoanalysis think about that is, what prediction is the patient using? So knowing which feeling the patient suffers from, which need is currently not being met, enables us to narrow our focus, to make it more easy to recognize what the transference is. Because if, for example, the patient is suffering from panic disorder, uh, this means that that need is not being met. So then we look to their, to their transference in terms of this is an enactment of a prediction about how to obtain the love and attention and care uh, of my object. So it helps us just to recognize more, more easily what the transference is all about because, because we know what kind of object relationship uh, 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 we're dealing with. We look to the transference and to the history uh, in order to infer what the unconscious uh, prediction is. And, and it really helps a great deal. But also remember another shift in emphasis in our technique is the very idea of thinking of transference in these terms, of recognizing that what transference is, is an enactment of a repressed prediction um, and, and seeing it as a, as a prediction. If I do this, then that, will, that need will be met. When I'm in the state of this emotional need, this is what I must do to, to meet it. This, this is the language, as it were, the structure uh, of, of unconscious predictions. And, 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 helping, and it helps to see more clearly what's going on when we see the transference in these terms. Um, all of these things, I'm having to say them to you very schematically. I'm sorry, it all sounds so dogmatic, I'm sure but I'm, I'm just wanting to give you a first introduction. Now, um, the next point, uh, and then I've, I'm very nearly finished, um, is that by drawing the patient's attention to the unconscious prediction, it does not reconsolidate the prediction because it can't be. Remember, those unconscious memory traces cannot be brought back into a state of consciousness. So by drawing the patient's attention to their enactment, it doesn't extinguish the original trace. That trace stays there. Um, so what we do by making interpretations to our patients, uh, can you see that you did it there? You did it again, you did it again. You know, it's what we call working through, showing that that's that pattern so that slowly the patient recognizes by being made aware of the pattern, uh, of, the, of the, the structure of their transference, the nature of their transference enactments, uh, it problematizes those predictions. It's sort of saying, well, you know, maybe I could do it differently. Uh, and so, um, again, I'm putting it extremely simply, but that's the whole point of problem of making the patient aware of the transference is so that they can recognize this is something from another place and another time. I'm acting as if this is going, as if this is going, but you know, it's not. And so that enables the patient slowly to lay down new predictions and consolidate new predictions alongside the old ones. It doesn't remove the old ones, which is why our patients can always go back to their bad old ways. We, we can all always go back to our bad old ways because our bad old ways remain there. Um, you don't ever undo uh, unconscious predictions. Uh, they, they, they are permanent. Uh, as Joseph Ledoux, a, a famous neuroscientist, says, they are indelible. They cannot be, they cannot be taken away. 
uh, but by working through, by showing again and again and again and problematizing again and again and again uh, the patient's prediction in, as enacted in their transference, broadly defined, enables them to slowly consolidate better, more mature, more realistic, more successful predictions. And because they work, uh, they become the go-to option. One last thing before I end is that in neuropsychoanalysis, we draw a distinction between repression, a repressed prediction, uh, which is aimed at meeting the need, but doesn't, uh, and a defense. Defenses, we don't think repression is just one of the mechanisms of defense. We think repressions are predictions which inevitably fail. That's the meaning of repressed predictions. It means that they're illegitimately automatized. They don't actually meet the need. They're ways of going about meeting those triad needs, which is not successful. Um, then it will, the patient will suffer feelings because the need is not met and defenses are directed towards the feelings. The re 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 predictions, uh, uh, repressed predictions are directed at the, how to meet the need uh, because they haven't met the need, defenses are directed at the feelings. So a defense interpretation is, can you see you doing this in order not to feel that? It's not the same thing as the, 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 the prediction, which is this is the way of meeting the need, the childish way of meeting the need. It's a very important distinction for all sorts of reasons. Uh, defenses are, are not established necessarily in childhood and defenses are not necessarily uh, unconscious. Uh, many a patient, you can say, can you see that you're doing that uh, in order not to feel this? And the patient says, yes, I know, but I've got no choice. Yes, I know, but I've got no choice. Uh, patients can think about their defenses. And to, uh, and to confuse the two will make it much more difficult to understand what the transference is and to reconstruct their repressed prediction. First, we analyze defenses, uh, and mostly our patients come to us when their defenses fail them. That's what we call the return of the repressed. The, the memory doesn't return, the feeling returns, um, and that's due to a failure of defenses. So this is our main focus, uh, but to the extent that there are defenses which remain intact, to that extent, they need to be interpreted too in the, in the manner that I've, that I've just uh, summarized. So dear colleagues, uh, with great apologies for giving you such a extremely rushed lecture covering such extremely um, complicated uh, uh, and, and, and uh, complex uh, and uh, difficult uh, and large uh, body of, of, of knowledge. Uh, I hope I have at least given you some impression of what sorts of things we are learning in neuropsychoanalysis, of what sorts of implications um, it has uh, for our clinical work. And I, I, and I hope that it will whet your appetite to learn more um, by reading that article and uh, 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 better still, uh, by attending uh, one of our clinical seminars uh, where we illustrate uh, these concepts with reference to uh, actual uh, psychoanalytic therapies and, 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 and treatments. Um, and as I said, tomorrow I'll be doing a seminar like that with a small group of uh, members of, of tonight's audience. Uh, but we have in neuropsychoanalysis, we have many such uh, clinical seminars uh, 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 and if anybody wants uh, to uh, have more information about that, they, they can please, uh, they, they, they should please contact me. So that's what I wanted to say. That's an introduction to the clinical implications of neuropsychoanalysis. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>